Uh, today, as I said, we're going to talk about Constantinople and then about Ephesus. So first, Constantinople, the cradle of Eastern Christianity. Tomorrow, we're going to dock in Istanbul. Istanbul is the most exotic city I have ever visited. Roman, Byzantine, and Ottoman elements combine with modern secular Turkey to form a fascinating culture. The sights and sounds of Istanbul are a world away from American culture. The architecture of the mosques and the Hagia Sophia pictured here, the strange wail of the call to prayer going out over loudspeakers, the huge sacks of spices in the Grand Bazaar, the remnants of the once great Ottoman Empire, the beauty of the Bosporus Straits where Asia meets Europe, the fabulous Turkish cuisine, all of these and more make a visit to Istanbul an unforgettable experience. The city that we call Istanbul was once the greatest city of Christendom, Constantinople. The Christian cannot visit the city today without feeling a deep sense of loss and tragedy. Once the capital city of Christianity, Constantinople fell into Muslim hands and became for hundreds of years the seat of the caliph or the caliph, the worldwide spiritual leader of Islam. The city, unlike some of the other principal sites that we're visiting on this trip, is not a New Testament city, but rather emerges in church history as a city of inestimable importance and influence for Christianity. Founded around 660 BC, the city was originally called Byzantium after its king, Byzas. The city was then incorporated into the Roman Empire in A.D. 73. The story of how it came to be called Constantinople is fascinating. During the great persecution of Christians initiated by the Roman Emperor Diocletian at the beginning of the 300s, there were four Caesars ruling different parts of the Roman Empire two senior Caesars and two subordinate Caesars. Constantine was the son of the Caesar Constantius, who ruled Britain and Gaul. Constantius did not pursue the persecution of Christians as the other Caesars in the empire did. And when Constantius died, his son Constantine decreed a formal end to the persecution in his region and returned to Christians all of the goods that had been taken from them during the persecutions. Well, war among these competing Caesars eventually broke out, and in 312, Constantine, with his armies, uh, marched out of Gaul and into Italy. As he approached Rome, the contemporary church historian Eusebius says that while marching at midday, and I quote, he saw with his own eyes in the heavens a trophy of the cross arising from the light of the sun, carrying the message, in this sign you shall conquer. Constantine had a dream that same night in which Christ appeared with the same heavenly sign and told him to make a standard for his army with that form. Constantine then won a very quick victory and was declared to be Augustus Caesar, or the venerable Caesar. Constantine credited the Christian God for his victory. In 313, he and his co-emperor, Licinius issued the Edict of Milan, officially granting full tolerance to Christianity and indeed to all religions throughout 
the Roman Empire. Within a few years, however, Licinius reneged on the religious freedom promised in the Edict of Milan and began to oppress uh, Christians again in his region. Well, that constituted a challenge for Constantine, climaxing in the Great Civil War of 324, in which Constantine emerged as the sole emperor of the Roman Empire. Constantine was the first Christian emperor of the Roman Empire, and he was zealous to promote the Christian faith. He was responsible, for example, for convening the famous Council of Nicaea in 325, where the Nicene Creed was promulgated. In 330, Constantine made the remarkable decision to move the capital of the Roman Empire from Rome in the west to Constantinople, uh, or Byzantium rather, in the east. And he quite quickly uh, discerned that uh, Byzantium was a far more defensible site and more strategically located in the empire than Rome. And he proposed to call the new capital New Rome but it quickly became known as his namesake, namely Constantinople. So it was named then after the Emperor Constantine. Constantine's instincts were vindicated by subsequent history. In 476, Rome fell to the barbarian invaders. But Constantinople, surrounded by its miles of massive triple walls remained impregnable right up until the 13th century. After Rome's demise, the Roman Empire with its capital now in Constantinople continued to flourish in the east and its citizens thought of themselves as and called themselves Romans. In Constantinople, manuscripts of ancient Greek and Latin authors were preserved despite their widespread destruction uh, in the West, thereby both classical learning and the writings of the Church Fathers were preserved. Constantinople became the cradle of Greek-speaking Eastern Orthodox Christianity. The crowning church of Constantinople and indeed of Christendom, was the Hagia Sophia, or Church of Holy Wisdom, which was dedicated on the 26th of December in the year 537. Moreover, Constantinople also became Europe's outpost, inhibiting for centuries the spread of Islam into Europe. Unlike the Roman Catholic Church, Eastern Orthodoxy recognizes the Bishop of Rome as merely the first among equals, in Latin primus inter pares, first among equals. The bishops of Jerusalem, Antioch, Alexandria, and Constantinople were also recognized as patriarchs of the Church equal in authority, if not in eminence, to the Bishop of Rome. For orthodoxy, ultimate authority resides in the decrees of the ecumenical councils of the church, of which seven were recognized. Number one, the first ecumenical council at Nicaea, convened by Constantine in 325, which condemned Arianism and declared the Son to be of the same substance as God the Father. Two, the second ecumenical council at Constantinople in 381, which served to clarify the terminology of Nicaea by stating that the Son and the Father, though of the same substance or nature, are different hypostases or individuals of that nature. 
3, the third ecumenical council at Ephesus in 431, which affirmed that Mary is the mother of God, or the God-bearer, in contrast to Nestorianism. Four, the fourth ec ecumenical council held at Chalcedon in 451, which affirms that Jesus is truly God and truly man, having two natures united in one person without confusion of the natures or division of the person. Five, the fifth ecumenical council, again at Constantinople in 553, which clarified the statements of Chalcedon so as to make clear that the one person Christ is, is the source of all his operations. Six, the sixth ecumenical council, again held at Constantinople in 681, which condemned monothelitism, the view that there is just one will in Christ rather than two wills, human and divine. And finally, number seven, the Seventh Ecumenical Council at Nicaea in 787, which endorsed the veneration of icons, but prohibits their worship. Now, if you just notice where these seven ecumenical councils were held, you notice they're all in this region. They're all in modern-day Turkey, which uh, shows the significance of uh, Eastern Christianity in Constantinople for Christendom. Now, it should be noted that although these are referred to as ecumenical councils being recognized by Protestant, Orthodox, and Catholic alike, nevertheless, there are branches of the Christian church that rejected some of them. For example, the Coptic church in Egypt Re rejects the Council of Chalcedon, holding that in Christ there is a single divine human nature. Similarly, less well-known, but nevertheless very significant historically, is the so-called Church of the East, which is a Nestorian branch of Christianity which penetrated Central Asia and China and persisted in the court of the Mongol Empire, founded by Genghis Khan, right up until the 14th century, making Christianity an indigenous Chinese religion. These splits within Christendom, however, pale in comparison to the split that occurred between East and West. The linguistic differences between the Latin-speaking West and the Greek-speaking East, as well as the deep cultural differences and the political divide between East and West, made it difficult to preserve the unity of the church, even though both recognize the authority of the seven ecumenical councils. Certainly the Roman Church's claim to the supremacy of the Pope or the Bishop of Rome made it impossible for the Eastern Churches to fully embrace Roman Christianity. But the difference between East and West is far more fundamental than that. Eastern Orthodoxy has a much more mystical approach to God and to Christian faith than does the West. This deep difference came to a boil over the addition of the so-called filioque clause to the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed of 381. That creed confesses belief in the Holy Spirit, quote, who proceeds from the Father, end quote. In the year 1014, so some 700 years later, theologians in the West added to the creed the words filioque, and from the Son. The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and from the Son. 
Eastern Orthodoxy repudiates this addition to the creed. Their complaint is far more than the fact that this phrase represents an addition to the original ecumenical creed and so lacks the authority of an ecumenical council. Rather, the phrase serves to epitomize the deep differences in approach to Christian faith between the East and the West. Here is how one Russian Orthodox uh, scholar whom I spoke with in St. Petersburg explained it to me. The Son is the second person of the Trinity, the Logos, or the mind or reason of God. To affirm that the Spirit proceeds not directly from the Father, but only indirectly from the Father via the Son is to pass the Spirit, as it were, through the filter of reason so that he becomes rationalized in relation to us. By contrast, in orthodox thinking, the Spirit proceeds directly from the Father without the filter of the Logos. This affords a more mystical, ah-rational approach to the Father. Mystical communion with God takes precedence over the enunciation of propositional truths about God. Reject the scholastic approach to Christianity as pagan and tantamount to heresy. A theologian who has not come to know God in a deep, personal way is not qualified to do genuine theology. He just minces words. He actually impedes the knowledge of God by his rationalistic disquisitions. Now, if you were to ask me for my own evaluation of this dispute, I'm inclined to think that the whole doctrine of the procession of the Son and the Spirit is unbiblical and misconceived. And so I'm not inclined to side with either Catholicism or Orthodoxy on that specific question. But as to what that question epitomizes, I should say that as the name reasonable faith indicates, we should not think that an intimate, personal relationship with God need exclude the rational mind. Now, I am inclined to agree that Roman Catholic theology, and Thomism in particular, has been polluted by Aristotelian philosophy. And in that sense, I sympathize with the Orthodox thinkers. But that is no reason to abandon rational thought about the divine. Rather, it is a call to think more deeply and more clearly about uh, the divine. The very ecumenical creeds themselves are shot through with philosophical conceptions about substance, essence, person, and so forth. I think that mysticism is inherently dangerous precisely because it is irrational and therefore unconstrained by reason. It can therefore easily lead its practitioners into error. We can cultivate a closer relationship with God even as we think logically and rigorously about his nature and work. Well, the decisive event in the schism between East and West finally occurred in the year 1054 when representatives of the Pope strode into the Hagia Sophia during the divine liturgy or mass and laid a writ of excommunication of the patriarch of Constantinople on the altar. In retaliation, he in turn excommunicated the papal representatives. <laughs> this rupture of East and West only widened in ensuing years. 
And so 1054 is taken to be the date of the separation of Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy. Meanwhile, migratory Turks from Eastern Asia began moving into Anatolia, or modern-day Turkey. Uh, this slide shows the Byzantine Empire in the year 1025. By 1080, much of the Byzantine Empire had been eroded due to the encroachment of these uh, migratory Turks. Still, Constantinople continued to grow, and during the Middle Ages, it became the richest and largest city in Europe, a commercial center which dominated the trade routes between East and West. Its influence upon art, architecture, and culture was far-reaching from Italy to Russia. Now, those of you who were on the Israel trip may recall the Kingdom of Jerusalem that had been set up in Palestine by the Crusader Knights in the 12th century. You'll recall the crushing defeat of those knights between the horns of Hatton in Galilee by the Muslim invaders under Saladin in 1187. Following the knights' expulsion from Jerusalem, the Third and Fourth Crusades were launched to take Jerusalem back from Muslim control. But in one of the most shameful acts of perfidy in Christian history, the Fourth Crusade, out of greed and jealousy, was diverted from its objective of taking Jerusalem and ignoring the protests of the Pope, it launched an attack upon Constantinople instead. In April of 1204, for the first time in its history, the walls of Constantinople were breached. For three days, the Crusaders sacked the city, looting, murdering, raping, burning, and destroying priceless treasures. In his book, Byzantium and Europe, Speras Virantis describes what happened, and I quote, the Latin soldiery subjected the greatest city in Europe to an indescribable sack. For three days, they murdered, raped, looted, and destroyed on a scale which even the ancient Vandals and Goths would have found unbelievable. Constantinople had become a veritable museum of ancient and Byzantine art, an emporium of such incredible wealth, the Latins were astounded at the riches they found. Though the Venetians had an appreciation for the art they discovered, they were themselves semi-Byzantines, and saved much of it. The French and others destroyed indiscriminately, halting to refresh themselves with wine, violation of nuns, and murder of Orthodox clerics. The Crusaders vented their hatred for the Greeks most spectacularly in the destruction of the greatest church in Christendom. They smashed the silver iconostasis, the icons, and the holy books of the Hagia Sophia, and seated upon the patriarchal throne a whore who sang coarse songs as they drank wine from the church's holy vessels. The estrangement of East and West, which had proceeded over the centuries, culminated in the horrible massacre that occurred in, that accompanied the conquest of Constantinople. The Greeks were convinced that even the Turks, had they taken the city, would not have been as cruel as the Latin Christians. What an incredible tragedy uh, in church history. Eventually, after a half century of Latin rule, the Greeks did wrest control of Constantinople back from the Latins, but the city had been fatally weakened, making it vulnerable to Turkish invasion, and thus facilitating 
the very victory of Islam that the Crusaders had been meant to undo. In 1543, or rather 1453, for only the second time in its history, Constantinople, surrounded by territory, under Muslim control, finally fell to the invaders. This time the Ottoman Turks, led by the Sultan Mehmed II. Upon entering the fallen city, the Sultan rode his horse to the Hagia Sophia, where he ordered a Muslim imam to recite, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the prophet of Allah, thereby converting the church into a mosque. Constantinople now became the capital city of the Muslim Ottoman Empire. Let me conclude by saying a word about this remarkable empire as well. The name Ottoman derives from its founder, Osman Bey, a Turkish ruler who uh, established the state in 1299. The Ottoman Empire endured for 623 years until November of 1922, when the modern state of Turkey was founded in the aftermath of World War I. After conquering Constantinople, the Ottoman dynasty took on the status of the Islamic Caliphate. That is to say, its ruler was also the spiritual ruler of worldwide Islam as well. During its height in the 16th and 17th century, under Suleiman the Magnificent, uh, who built the walls of Jerusalem that we saw uh, in visiting that city, it became a world power which actually threatened to conquer Europe. Having taken Serbia and Hungary, Suleiman twice laid siege to Vienna, but was repulsed each time. Another siege of Vienna was attempted in 1683, but an alliance of Habsburg, German, and Polish forces beat back the Turkish advance. It is sobering to think what would have happened had the battle swung the other way. By the mid-19th century, the Ottoman Empire was in a state of decline uh, called the sick man of Europe. In November of 1914, it aligned itself with the Central Powers in World War I, where it fought in the Middle Eastern theater against the Arab revolt spearheaded by T.E. Lawrence, the famous Lawrence of Arabia. In 1915, it began the ethnic cleansing of its Armenian population, resulting in the deaths of some three million people. With the defeat of the Central Powers, Constantinople was occupied by Allied forces, only the third time that the city had fallen to conquerors. The Allied occupation was ended by the Turkish War of Independence, which brought to power a young Turkish military and political leader called Kemal Ataturk, who became the architect of modern Turkey and who is revered by Turks as the father of their country. The Ottoman Empire came to an official end in 1923 with the foundation of the modern state of Turkey. Love him or hate him, Ataturk was an extraordinary man of astonishing vision, ability, and tenacity. Ataturk wanted to transform Turkey from an Islamic backwater into a modern European state. He abolished the caliphate and established in Turkey a secular government and political system. He abolished the Arabic script and started a new alphabet for Turkish. 
he launched a program of mandatory non-religious education in schools. He adopted fashionable Western dress and abolished the Turkish fez. Unfortunately, Ataturk's reforms of modern Turkey represented a ruthless imposition of secularism upon a fundamentally religious society. As such, it must leave the Christian observer feeling rather uneasy about the whole thing. While we decry Islam's attempt to exert religious control of the state, we must also be vigilant in defending our freedom from state control of religion. As one missionary to Turkey explained to Jan and me, in modern Turkey, we do not have the separation of church, uh, or rather religion and the state, uh, mosque and the state, if you will. You do not have the separation of state and religion. Rather, you have the control of religion by the state. Even the sermons preached in the Friday services in the mosques are directed by the state. They are furnished to the imams who give these sermons. Now, can you imagine your pastor's sermon being directed by government control? And now Islam is beginning to reassert itself in modern Turkey. Is this a dangerous retrogression to earlier years of Islamic control, or is it an expression of religious freedom to be encouraged, or is it both? This is part of the complexity of modern Turkey.